Welcome to Kitchen Sink. Um, this is Kitchen Sink, the cafe. And this is Kitchen Sink, the teaching kitchen, um, which I hope you'll come and visit and learn about. We have a lot of cooking classes going on. But today, it's my pleasure to have our first uh, guest from San Francisco, uh, an author, a food writer, and a chef. Carolyn Jung is, um, was a former colleague of mine. She's a food writer, an award-winning food writer for the San Jose Mercury. And she hit upon this idea of writing a book about the very best chefs in San Francisco and getting a recipe from each one of them. And she chose for us today Chef Bill Corbett of Absinthe, uh, which is a, a noted San Francisco restaurant. And, and he's got some treats for us to taste afterwards. Thank you guys for taking time out on your very, very busy day. I know you have work to do, but you know, this is so much better, isn't it? I mean, we have an afternoon of talking about sweets and then eating dessert. So I think that beats work any day. So I, um, as Olivia was so kindly enough to introduce me, I'm a longtime Bay Area food writer. I was at the Mercury News for many years, and now I freelance for a number of publications locally nationally, even sometimes internationally, and I do my own blog called foodgal.com. And I was lucky enough to be approached last year to do um, this book, San Francisco Chef's Table, which is a compilation of about 50 or more restaurants around the Bay Area with their stories and their signature recipes. So it sort of fell into my lap, I like to say, or actually into my inbox. Um, here I was just working away on my computer at home and this email came over from the publisher who does this chef series books around the country um, asking me if I wanted to do the San Francisco one, which shocked as I was, there was not a San Francisco one already. And I was thrilled, but then I had a heart attack when she said, we can only give you three months to do it. Um, which, yeah, if you've, you've ever worked on a project like that, is not a whole lot of time. So I was really grateful um, that I was able to sweet talk a number of chefs, including the one sitting next to me, um, into being a part of this book. Because really, they're the ones that made this um, such, I think, a really remarkable, usable, and, and fun book. Um, and what I looked for in the chefs that I chose was um, restaurants that represented San Francisco. Either they were iconic ones, um, like um, Swan Oyster Depot, or hot, hip, happening restaurants of the moment, like State Bird Provisions in San Francisco that most of us can't even get into, even if we wish we could. Um, and recipes that were actually doable, because um, I don't want the book to just be sitting pretty on a coffee table. I want people to actually try and cook from it. And granted, there are some dishes in there that are more challenging than others. There are others that are very, very straightforward. So I would like to introduce you to um, a pastry chef who I so admire. And if you have not had the chance to try his desserts, you will this afternoon. And I I guarantee that it will put a smile on your face. So Bill Corbett is the executive pastry chef of the Absinthe Group in San Francisco, which consists of Absinthe Brasserie, The Boxing Room, Comstock Saloon, Arlequin, and a soon-to-be-named new restaurant yeah. in Soma. Yeah, it's a soon-to-be-named uh, Spanish restaurant in Soma. And you are responsible for the dessert programs at all of those restaurants. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so yeah, I do desserts for all four, all four of the restaurants we have currently, and uh, soon I'll have a, a fifth one on my on my hands. So yeah. So you're a busy man. We're pretty busy. <laughs> we have it pretty organized, so it's not it doesn't eat my whole life up, but it's but it's uh, it, it works out okay. So one thing you might not know about Bill um, is that if given his druthers. He would have actually not been a pastry chef, but a heavy metal musician, right? Just rock and roll in general, <laughs> yeah. I, if I could play guitar and that well, then, you know, maybe, but, you know. But uh, definitely music is, is a big passion of mine, but cooking is a little more realistic, I think. 
So I had the pleasure also of interviewing one of your colleagues and friends recently, Brooks Headley, the pastry chef of Del Posto in New York. And he used to be a heavy metal drummer. Yeah, he's um, he's he's a real deal drummer. He's I actually listened to his bands long before I ever met him, and so he's he's been in some a lot of really great punk bands in the '90s and things. And like I know that. there I'm I know there are probably other few pastry chefs out there with this fondness for that type of music. So I just have to ask: on one hand, you have these very dark lyrics and music. And on the other hand, in what you do in your day job, you have this very sweet, frilly, um, sponge sugar type environment. So what is up with that? I, I, I don't know if the environment's so sweet if you're <laughs> hanging out in the kitchen, but um, I think there's a certain level of precision maybe that goes along with both sides of things. When you listen to heavy metal, there's a lot of precision in the drums and the guitars. Um, so I think there's, and with pastry, it's all about, there's a lot of precision that goes into, you know, everything from how you weigh the ingredients to how the dish looks. And so, so I think it, it might have more to do with that, um, than that, that kind of appreciation and punk rock and heavy metal are sort of the underdogs of the music industry. And, and we're also kind of the underdogs of the, of the culinary scene. We're always the kind of ones in the background. So I think it all kind of, it works out well. It, it makes sense. I think. Do you listen to, to metal while you're cooking and baking? Yeah, yeah, I torture my cooks a lot. So they, <laughs> they have to listen to like, but they, I, you know, it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not like they don't get to listen to their music either. So there's a good balance in the kitchen, but definitely I listen to a lot of kind of more aggressive, faster music. I think it keeps me going more. It keeps me excited. And, and uh, I don't know, I don't get bored that way. So, so I know you grew up in Canada. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah. Huh? <laughs> so you grew up in Canada and you left Canada for Florida with $800 in your pocket following some friends who were in bands. Yeah. And you took your, I guess, your first job actually in the restaurant industry at the Psychic Cafe. Yeah, yeah. So I worked in, um, back in, I think it was around 99, I moved to Florida. Um, I had met all these amazing people in punk bands and, you know, they're all touring and living this inspiring life. And I thought, this is awesome. I want to go live with these people. So I had about $800 in my pocket and moved down. I sold, you know, tons of extra records I didn't want anymore and things like that just to get some money and just moved to Florida with no kind of real plan. Ended up living there for two years. Met my wife now. So maybe it was fate, huh? Yeah, yeah I think it might have been. So. It, yeah, and then I ended up working at a cafe, um, working in the kitchen and kind of running, running the kitchen. And it's, uh, it was, you could go in and get a psychic reading and lunch kind of thing. It was really, it was, a, it was an odd place, that's for sure. And how long were you there? I was there pretty much the whole two years I worked or lived in in Florida. So, it was, it it was an interesting. It's an interesting culture, let's just say, with uh, <laughs> with all these psychics running around and then. Uh, yeah, it's it's very Florida almost. There's did did you ever have a psychic reading done yourself? No, I didn't really. I, I don't know. I know they would always try to tell me things about my life and what I should be doing and things, and I would always kind of just you know, take it with a grain of salt and get back to you know making a sandwich or something, whatever I was doing at the time. <laughs> so now it it, it kind of was fate that you met your wife there because you then followed her to New York where she was studying. And it was in New York where you met someone who was very pivotal, pivotal in your career, Lincoln Carson. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, after uh, who is the corporate pastry chef for Michael Mina restaurant? Actually, not anymore. He just left. Oh, did yeah, he? he? Where just, is he now? He just moved to L.A. He's uh, he just helped open a place called Superba Food and Bread. Oh, in LA. okay. But uh, so yeah, I ended up moving to New York after my wife and I got married. Uh, she was going to art school there, and. Um, Ended up wanting to work in real kitchens there and kind of fell in. Basically, I didn't have culinary school background and I hadn't worked on the line in New York, so nobody would hire me. And then uh, I, I luckily met this person who was working for Lincoln Carson. And she said, why don't you come try out? So I went and tried out and he saw that I wanted to learn. So he hired me. And then from then on, I, you know, I, he took me under his wing. And, and for my career, it really, I, I don't think my career would have gone where it has gone without having that kind of encounter. Because, I mean, actually, you started on the savory side, right? 
Sort of. I, I started on Savory in, in really weird places like the Mongolian Grill Buffet and like, you know, and then a psychic cafe. And and, so, and then I was working at a bar in, in uh, Brooklyn when I first moved to New York. I worked in the kitchen at a bar. And so I did all the savory food in there. But So sort of on the savory side, but nowhere in, in kind of a real serious cooking environment until I got into pastry. So what's the most important thing Lincoln taught you? Um... Kind of to be methodic about about things when it comes everything from you know even zesting an orange you know making sure you're kind of doing it in a methodical way so it's more efficient and time you know time sensitive and you know he he taught me so much though I can't that, that's just like one of the major things but he was a very he's a very methodical worker and the way he prepares a dish and the way he executes it and so it taught me a ton about how to execute dishes from start to finish and how to produce them at high volume and and be able to still maintain consistency and quality. And then you went to go work um, at WD-50 with Wiley Dufresne, the madman of molecular gastronomy. So yeah. in an environment like that, I mean, do all the rules sort of go out the window and anything is fair game to try? You know, there's a definite... I wouldn't say all the rules go out the window. I, I would say... You know, Wiley's a big believer in a solid foundation and, and understanding your technique. Um, but then it's kind of like once you understand the rules, then you can break the rules kind of thing. And, and, and that was one of the most incredible learning experiences working with Wiley because there was... Uh, I worked under the pastry chef Sam Mason there at the time and then, and then he left and, and Alex Stupak came on board. Um, and just seeing how you kind of threw everything out and just, you were able to try anything you wanted. And Wiley, you know, you could come to him and say, what if you did this with this ingredient? And he would say, try it, you know? He wouldn't just try to give you the answer of why it wouldn't work or why it might, he would say, try it. Can you describe a couple of the really sort of out there desserts that you did there? Um, some of the desserts we were doing there were, um, like we did a Manchego cheesecake with quince and pineapple, uh, which, I think today maybe doesn't sound as crazy as it did maybe 10 years ago, but it was kind of, it was a bigger technical trick, I think, than, than so much the flavor was so mind, mind. It was, it was, it's not something that maybe blew people's minds flavor-wise. When you ate it, it was really good. But what I'm saying, like the thought process or the kind of, when you see that on a menu, you don't go, oh my God, Manchego in a dessert. But it was, it was more the technique of how do you get Manchego into it into a cheesecake sort of thing, you know, and it was, because if you just throw a manchego in a cheesecake, it's this very hard cheese, it doesn't really, it doesn't break down, when it melts, it gets kind of oily, so, and, and sometimes it was uh, just trying to figure out the almost dumbest way of going about it, so we ended up just pureeing the cheese with water, and sort of making this thick puree that was kind of this consistency of cream cheese, and then folding it into the cake, and it worked, and but there's so there'd be desserts like that. I, I try to think, they don't, I, I guess now it's, just, it's weird because they don't seem like they sound so outrageous. But we were doing things, I guess, at the time that, that were, and we were doing things with, you know, a butternut squash sorbet with chocolate. And, and Sam Mason was doing things like soy caramel and parsnip cake and, and really kind of, but, but exercising a really great balance between sweet and savory without, the dish, it was still a dessert, you know? It wasn't like a savory dish with some sugar added to it. It was still, it was still a dessert, and I think that was the important thing. So then, of course, you went on to work at Qua in San Francisco, Daniel Patterson's famed restaurant. Mm -hmm. Now, Daniel, I know, is known to be quite the taskmaster and quite the perfectionist. So what was it like working for him? It was, it was great, because it was... Um, it really taught me to boil down the things I knew and kind of strip away the non-essential things, like the things that were maybe fluff and didn't really need to be in the dish or, you know, so kind of taking a dish and kind of boiling it down to its essentials. And it was, um, it, you know, the dishes, yeah, there's this whole perfectionist thing going on, but there's also just incredible ingredients and, and using the best ingredients. And that was what it was about. And, and then having the food not interfere with itself and, and, but still, I don't know, the combination seemed so simple at the time, and, and my dishes got simpler and simpler and simpler almost, the way they looked. But the technique behind them was still the same. I was just stripping away a lot, I think. I think that's true with a lot of chefs as they mature. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, can you just tell by looking at a plate if there's, like, everything plus the kitchen sink on there that it's a younger chef who probably made yeah, it? Yeah, I think there's a lot of times you can look and say, 
okay, this person has a lot of ideas, and they're trying to fit all these ideas into one plate. And it's, it's not a horrible thing. It's part of the learning process. Uh, but you kind of start to, as you, as you grow and mature, you definitely learn what's, what's necessary, what's not, and how you can actually kind of just make the dish greater by almost simplifying a little bit. So where does inspiration come from when you set about creating a new dessert? Is it an ingredient that you spy? Is it something from your memory? What triggers it? It's, it's kind of, it's just everything that surrounds me almost. It's not like I'm, um, it's not like I'm inspired by everything in some hippie way, like, oh, look at the leaves out there, now I'm gonna make a dessert based on that bush <laughs> over there. But like, it's, it's more like, for me, it's just, inspiration comes either from at the market, you know, I see some really great products, and you just can't turn away from it. Like, like me, walk kumquats are an example, you know, from, from Brokaw Farms at the San Francisco Ferry Building, they, you get these kumquats, and you just eat them whole, they're not bitter, they're sweet, they're really well balanced, there's enough acid, and you're just like, I can't, I can't not use this ingredient. And so you kind of build a dish around it. Um, and then sometimes it is a combination, sometimes it's, you know, like the beet cake in the book is, is kind of my take on the salad you find at every San Francisco restaurant, which is roasted beets, goat cheese, and walnuts, and then maybe it's got some orange segments or something or some fennel involved. But it's generally those three ingredients, so I thought, they all work in dessert, so why don't I make a dessert with them? So, so I did the beet cake with a, a goat fromage blanc uh, frosting and then candied walnuts. So... You know, it'll be like that. I'll see something and I'll want to kind of riff on it a little bit. Or or it's just like this great combination of herbs and fruit. Like strawberries go so well with things like tarragon or basil, you know, or fennel. Or, you know, there's so many different things. Uh, and I pull a lot of that from the savory side, I think. And when, when, you, when you start experimenting, how long does it take to perfect something? Is it many, many, many tries? Or sometimes is it just bang on right from the start? It's pretty rare that it's bang on right from the start. When that happens, it's amazing, but it's it's pretty rare. Um, I would say it's usually, you know, you. at this point, I, I feel like I have a better understanding than I've ever had in the past where I can kind of put together a dish and be close on the first try. But then it usually takes, you know, two to three tries before I kind of tweak out the, the, what I need um, or what I think the dish needs. Um, so yeah, it's, it's never usually the first try. It usually takes a little while. And is there any ingredient that you could never envision in a dessert, or is everything pretty much up for grabs in your mind? I think just like onions, you onions, know? Okay. onions and garlic. <laughs> I just uh, I I for the life of me, you know. Garlic ice cream? No, no. <laughs> and, uh, I see, yeah, yeah. I, I know some people have have done things with black garlic, and maybe, but but I I, I don't know. I I just can't see it and. Uh, but there are other ingredients. Maybe I would I would have thought the same thing. You know, I I had a dish from Brooks Headley. Speaking of him, um, probably about two years ago now, or a year and a half ago, where it was a sancho carpaccio and yeast ice cream, and just really nice olive oil. So it was raw sunchokes and yeast ice cream. And I thought, okay, this is this is out there. This is not going to work. And then I ate it, and it was amazing. And he said it was his version of dipping your fries in your milkshake. Oh my and god. So, but it was. It was one of the biggest surprises, and, and when I get those surprises, those are what really excite me and make me want to explore further and maybe pass what I'm comfortable with or what I think is, it makes you think, like, maybe this, maybe, maybe I'm totally wrong. You know, maybe the, the ideas that I have and that I've formed, I need to throw them out the window and start again. And so I know we've talked about this because I've written about this um, for Food Arts Magazine, but I know there are times where you come up with a dessert and you think, oh, this is a hit, and... You wait and you wait, and nobody or very few people order it in the dining room. Um, has that happened rarely, often, sometimes? Uh, it happens once in a while. It's um, I always think I can predict a hit, and, and I feel like I, I'm always wrong. Every time I think I, I've got a hit on my hands, I'm almost always. <laughs> oh, I, I might enjoy the dessert. The staff might enjoy the dessert. And the guest who orders it probably enjoys the dessert, but it's getting the guests to order the dessert is the trick sometimes. But there's been really obvious ones, like uh, like I think the one in Food Arts referring to was a, it was a peanut financier with the Concord grape jelly, and I was like, oh, it's peanut butter and jelly. What can go wrong? And no one ordered it. 
And then I don't know if maybe peanut butter is maybe too lowbrow for, you know, for people to pay $10 for a dessert with peanut butter. I don't know, you know, but like, I think that might be just it. It's uh, sometimes you just, you, you think you've got it and you totally do not. And you think, oh, I'm just going to slam dunk this one, knock it out. And that's no one orders it. But then you do another dish sometimes that people, you really surprise you. Like I did a, I did a parsnip dish. It was, it was actually the parsnip cake that Sam Mason taught me. And I served it with, uh, it was just a buttermilk ice cream. It was really simple, and it was a butter, and it was a parsnip milk jam. And I thought, no one's going to order this parsnips for dessert. I'll put it on the menu because it'll be fun for a little while, but I'm probably going to have to take it off in a week or two. And it ended up being a big hit, and, and people loved it. Or the beet cake, for, for instance. I thought, the beet cake, I'll put it on. We'll sell a few. It's not going to be crazy, but it was a big hit, and we actually ended up making... I think almost a wedding cake a month that was Oh, made, really? Yeah, wedding cake? Yeah, wow. the beet cake for wedding cake. So it kind of... Kind of a new thing instead of red velvet, right? Kind of, yeah. And I think sometimes I think uh, just go with, go with your gut on what you're excited about. And then you're kind of cooking from this place that you're actually excited. And it's almost like... It just it always comes out better. So. Now, you would think a pastry chef is someone who goes out, orders dessert all the time, but that's not you, right? No. Oh. no. Um, the only time I think I order dessert is when I, when I either know who the pastry chef is and I know they have an actual pastry chef in house, then I'll probably order dessert. But if I'm going to most, you know, your neighborhood or restaurant that doesn't necessarily pay for a pastry chef and doesn't have a pastry chef, I'm, I'll, just, I'll take an extra potato course or something. You know, I'm like, I'd rather have... I just crave salt. I eat sweet all day long. I'm tasting it all day long, and I crave salt at the end of the day. And, you know, I'd rather, I'm much more, I find, like, cheese and potatoes and all these horrible things that I shouldn't be eating way more satisfying at the end of the day, probably. And you did not grow up in a foodie family. No, not at all. No. What did you eat as a child? Uh, you don't want to, it's, <laughs> it's like, my parents are going to call me up and yell at me, but... Um, they don't watch YouTube, right? <laughs> no, my dad, I had to set him up with a Gmail account, and it didn't really work so well. I don't think he's ever used it. I had to, I had to literally like set it up for him and then call him on the phone and guide him through logging in so I could send him a video to watch. And then, so that, yeah, I don't, and then he was like, where's the volume? Where's the volume? I can't hear anything. So it was for, you know, so he's not going to see it. My mom, my mom might see it. But um, yeah, it was, it was, it was, my parents weren't, and I, I don't, I'm not talking trash, but they, were, they just weren't good cooks. And they, they, you know, they never, there were a few things here and there that they surprise you. You pull out the recipe cards from the old, like, Betty, Betty Crocker, like, recipe card box, and you get excited. But there's a lot of things, like, I can remember my grandfather babysitting us once, and my grandfather was even, like, way further removed from cooking process of any kind, and tried to serve me like a bouillon cube in a, in a hot water and call it soup or something. You know, I was like, I was like, this isn't soup. It was like, just open a can. It's, a, it's you know, but yeah, so it's, um, yeah, I definitely didn't grow up in a foodie family. Um, my dad still, jo he jokes about it a lot. He's always asking me why I got to buy these fancy ingredients and things like that. So I remember when I interviewed you for my own blog years ago, you said your parents had never eaten in a restaurant you'd worked at. Is that still true? It's still true, yeah, because they live in Canada, and it's, you know, when they come to visit, I usually take time off. And they actually, you know, so it's, it's usually a thing where we don't get the chance to actually come sit down. And they haven't actually been out here since I've been, since I've lived out here. So I've been home a couple of times, but they haven't been out here, so... So they haven't had the chance, no. We came, they came to New York once, and we went to the restaurant so I could show them where I work. It was kind of day we were closed. And, and so, yeah, so they actually haven't been able to, they haven't been to eat at one of the restaurants I cook in yet. I, I think you need to remedy that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll work on that. <laughs> so given your love for music, if you wrote a heavy metal song about your life and career, what title would you give it? Oh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Probably have something to do with getting my act together. I, don't, <laughs> I, don't know. I think you've done pretty well already. I, I think you right, need another title yeah. there. <laughs> so you're now also one of the founding members of Killed by Dessert, an annual event to benefit Share Our Strength, which it started in New York, but now it's in San Francisco. Why did you want to become involved with that? And, and tell people a little bit about that event. So Kill by Dessert is a, it's an event where me and five other pastry chefs, we basically created this event where 
you come and you pretty much eat dessert. Um, we do each Not do a bad, huh? <laughs> we each do a savory course. Um, so there's uh, you come in, you get a savory hors d'oeuvre, and then you sit down and you get twelve courses of dessert. You get two courses from each pastry chef. So it's kind of like a fine dining <laughs> menu in reverse almost. Um, but the pastry chefs we have involved are incredible. There's Lincoln Carson, who I used to work for, and then Christina Tozzi from Omofuku, Brooks Headley from Del Posto, Michael Lasconis, who used to be the, the former pastry chef at Le, at Le Bernard Den, uh, Francisco Magoya, who works for the CIA. Um, so yeah, we have, you know, there's six of us, and it's this incredible thing. And basically what happens, the reason it all came about was just we wanted to kind of do an, a pastry event together. And then we... We picked a charity because we didn't really care about, you know, we weren't doing it to raise money for ourselves. So we thought, you know, let's 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 give them money to share our strength, and then it worked out because then they could they could use the we could use their ticketing infrastructure and things like that. And so, so they supported us that way, and then they get to keep all the money, and and it makes our lives much easier because we don't have to worry about selling tickets and all that kind of thing. And is it happening again this year? Uh, it'll happen. It's probably gonna happen in LA. It's, it hasn't oh, in been LA. Announced yet. Okay. We're trying to figure it out still, but. Um, it happens in a different city every time. So we did one in Brooklyn, we did one in Austin, we sort of did a half one in Washington D.C. Then we did San Francisco last year. This year will probably be L.A. There's a couple other cities on the map that we're we keep making promises to, but but it's an amazing event. It, you you know we raised uh, last year in San Francisco we raised twenty thousand dollars for Share Our Strength. So so I know you don't like the word self-taught. But you did not go to cooking school, right. and you sort of learned by doing through the working with really incredible people. So for anyone out there who is considering being a pastry chef, what is the best advice you could give them? I think, I think you've got to find your own path. I don't think school is necessarily a bad thing, and I don't think working, working your way up is a bad thing. Sometimes it can be really difficult also if you haven't gone to school to get somebody to give you a chance. So school is also a way, I think, for a lot of cooks to get their foot in the door, and I think it's important for a lot of cooks. I think it's really difficult to kind of not go to school and take the path I took, um, because no one wants to give you the time of day. Um, so it's so advice-wise, I would just say keep trying, like keep you know, get involved with a chef you're interested in, but. If you need, if you don't have any of those basic skills, like I worked in kind of those crappy restaurants coming up, so I had this, I at least had the language, and I knew how to hold a knife, and I knew these very simple, very basic skills, but, uh, but it's, if you don't have any of that, if you're just like, you know, you're a high school kid finishing up school, and you're like, I don't want, I don't know what I want to do with my life, I like to cook, but I've never really seen what it's like inside a kitchen, in a real professional kitchen. I would advise either going and learning what it's like or going to school to kind of get the language so you can then have your, get your foot in the door. So before I open it up to questions from all you guys, I wanted to play a fun little game with you that I actually did with Anthony Bourdain a few years ago when I interviewed him. He loved it, by the way, so I hope you will too. So I'm going to say uh, a topic, and I want you to say the first one or two words that come into your mind when you hear it. So... Cake pops. Starbucks. Oh. <laughs> Cronut. Dominican cell. Pop rocks in desserts. Uh, Lars Ulrich from Metallica. Only because I made his dad a birthday cake once and put pop put rocks in it. Put pop rocks in it? <laughs> the Food Network's Cupcake Wars show. Uh, I'll just, a uh, travesty. Is what, <laughs> I guess the first, yeah. Double stuff Oreos. Delicious. Butter. Nece necessary, I guess. <laughs> Ripe papaya. Um, vomit. <laughs> that was actually a trick one because I know that's his least favorite thing because of the aroma of a ripe papaya. But um, low-fat desserts. Um, eh, I guess. <laughs> eh. <laughs> and last but not least, Marissa Myers. Fabled Cupcake Spreadsheet. I don't know anything about that. Oh, well, we should connect them, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all. And if you have any questions, we'd love to answer them. If you have any for Bill. Um, so my question is, you alluded it to a little bit. You didn't grow up in a, a foodie household or anything. So I'm kind of curious, like, what was your first introduction to cooking? Not like cooking in a, 
like professional kitchen, but just as a kid or something, were you like flipping pancakes or something? Like, what did you so do? So I think for me, it was um, growing up, uh, food and cooking was this total mystery to me. And I, to me, I was just like, you either knew how to do it or you, or you didn't know how to do it. And I didn't know how to do it. So I was like, I just never thought I was going to cook. I never would have expected I ended up be cooking for a living. But I think probably the first time I realized that you can actually make something was probably home ec class in like, I don't know, seventh grade or something like that. And we made crepes. And I, I didn't get an A. No, no. There's, uh, yeah, I couldn't cook at that point. <laughs> I still was like, so I went home and tried it again, though, you know. And, and, but it was this thing where I was like, oh, you can actually make this. This isn't something you just buy or, you know or someone who knows how to cook can make it. You know, it's, this is, you can actually make something with the tools, you know? So, so that was kind of my first kind of eye-opening experience. It didn't really, it wasn't like, the, it was like, oh, I'm gonna be a chef now. It wasn't nothing like that. But it was definitely my first, that's the first time I remember thinking, oh, I can actually cook something and, you know, apply heat to something and change something and make it actually into something better than the sum of its parts, you know? So there's this um, delight with pairing salty and sweet, the caramel and sea salt thing. Um, do you see that continuing, or is that is that where we're going, the savory-sweet kind of intersection? I, I don't think it's necessarily where we're going. I think people are always going to want dessert, you know, and I, I think it's really important also that when you're applying kind of the savory-sweet side of things that you do it in a smart way that suddenly isn't making the product into... An appetizer, you know, it's it's still got to be sweet. It still has to taste like dessert. It's still, most people want something creamy and some maybe crunchy texture involved. You know, maybe some cake. You know, so people are gonna want those textures, I think. And I don't. People may go towards. I think the salty sweet thing has its applications, but I don't think across the board we're suddenly gonna be eating everything salty sweet. But I think it depends. You know, caramel is better with a little salt. You know. Does chocolate sell? If you put a chocolate dessert on your menu, is it usually a top seller? Yeah, chocolate is always kind of the top seller. I think people just automatically go for the chocolate dessert. Um, there's, there's, when people don't know what they want, they just get chocolate, I think. Um, because the chocolate does things in your brain, and it, you know, it, like, that's why they gave it to soldiers in the war and things like that. So, um, yeah, I think chocolate is always kind of the big sellers. You know, and honestly, it's it's the hardest dish to make. I think the, for me, the hardest dishes are chocolate dishes because I don't think chocolate goes with everything. Like everybody kind of pairs, chocolate has a way of being paired with everything, and I don't think it goes with all these things that people pair it with. I don't think chocolate and fruits are always the best. Certain chocolates and certain fruits, and it's kind of like treated like a wine almost, where you're pairing you know, terroir and wherever the beans are grown and how they're roasted and it changes everything. It's kind of like, you know, so it's, yeah, I think, uh, but I, I definitely, our number one and two sellers are chocolate desserts. Do you, have you tried to incorporate any international cuisines into your, your style? Because I know most of the pastries like American, French, Italian, just within a few countries, but have you tried anything outside of the norm? I definitely try to, I take inspiration, I think, from, from new ingredients that I might discover. But I don't necessarily try to kind of copy a cuisine, that, especially because I'm not fully familiar with those cuisines usually. And if I try to copy it, it's going to come off like this fake kind of non-authentic version of, of what it should be. So I'll take inspiration maybe from a, from a cuisine or, you know, or I might use something like a, like a red curry paste in a coconut ice cream. But, you know, it's, you know, things like that. And then you get this coconut curry ice cream kind of thing. But... But I'm not going to try to recreate necessarily a Thai dish because I don't understand the cuisine, and I don't, and I think it's going to come off as phony. Do you make pastries at home, or do you get the like friends and family asking you to, to make things? Um, I make stuff at home sometimes, not very often, um, and it's usually only for if I'm going to a party or something, then I'll make something. But, but generally, I don't, I don't make pastry. I usually just cook savory at home. Um, but yeah, I, I don't cook a lot of, and I think it drives me crazy because I have this at work, I have this amazing kitchen with all the tools and there's this non-exhaustible supply of pots because the dishwasher will wash them. And, <laughs> and when I'm at home, it's this tiny space and it's, you know, I have some of the equipment, but not all the equipment and I don't have the convection oven and, uh, you know, and it's kind of an excuse to be honest, but it's like, but it's like, 
it's just not as fun, you know? And so I'm kind of stuck, like, working with tools I don't necessarily like working with. And it's, and it's not, it just doesn't come as easily, so it's, I'd rather just do it at work and then bring it home. Did you make your own wedding cake? No, my mother-in-law made my wedding cake. Oh. Actually, it was before I worked in pastry that I, would, that when I got married, so I hadn't, I was not good at making pastry at that point. But my mother-in-law, for years, not, not when we got married, but years before, had a cake business. Oh, and so she so she would always make all these crazy cakes, like all the ones in different shapes. And really amazing. She's an amazing cake decorator. She's she does stuff that I, I that's not in my wheelhouse. So it's wow, that's high praise. So she did um yeah she did our so she did our wedding cake yeah. And we actually got married in their backyard in my in laws backyard. They live on a lake in Tampa and and it poured rain in the morning. It was a great time. <laughs> it actually all turned out okay, but it was stressful. Chef, will you um talk about the dessert and all the components of it. Let me get it for you. So we have uh, two desserts for you to try. One is the one we did in the class we did a little earlier, um, which was uh, we did a milk chocolate cream with basil meringue and a hazelnut crumb. And then it this was one good. Here. <laughs> and then uh, this one here is actually the beet cake that's in the, uh, that's in the book. So it's a beet cake with fromage blanc frosting, candied walnuts, and we, we garnished it with a little bit of uh, beet paper and beet caramel sauce. How do you make beet paper? So it's actually really simple. It looks like people probably think it's some scientific thing and we use some crazy weird gums to make it happen. But all we do is uh, we take beet puree, we roast the beets, puree them, we add a little bit of sugar, and then we spread it really thin and dehydrate it. That's it. It's, it's just so stunning to look at. I just want to add one thing, which is um, for some people this, this cake might be a little um, of a stretch to make. It's a little. It's not hard or complicated, but it does take a little bit of time, and it's incredible. But I would like to put a plug in for the garnish that is actually not on there today, the walnut ice cream, which mm -hmm. you've heard me rave about this. <laughs> so I actually made the ice cream when I was testing recipes for this book. And if you have an ice cream maker, it's so simple. And I tell you, it is the best walnut ice cream I have ever had. I was spinning it in the machine and keeping, I couldn't stop putting my spoon into the hole to <laughs> grab taste. I mean, I'm, I'm shocked there was any left to actually freeze in the freezer. It's, that's how good it is. So if you want to make something of Bill's in the book that is a little bit simpler, I recommend the walnut ice cream for sure. Well, thank you all so much. And... We're going to be here signing copies of the book, San Francisco Chef's Table. So hope you'll come by, and uh, we'll be happy to personalize them to you. Thank you.